Jen from JLM Music UK and on this channel I create videos to help you to find your piano learning that little bit more fun and enjoyable. Today's topic is scales. Um, this is a big one for a lot of us, to be honest, <laughs> myself included when I was learning. Um, it seems to be a real bone of contention for a lot of people, for both learners and for the parents and carers of learners as well. So today's video is to give you my top tips on how to really level up your scales. So first we need to look at why people struggle with practicing their scales. Um, I'm going to give you my top six excuses. I'm going to call this the excuses list. Number one, I find scales boring. Number two, I don't have time to do them because I have pieces to practice. Three, I don't know why I have to do them. Four, I don't know if I'm doing them right when I'm at home. Five, I can never remember the key signatures. And six, I can play them hands separately, but not together. Now that one is a firm favorite. As I said, these are just some of the most common things that I hear when it comes to scales practice. And the first thing we're going to do is to look at numbers one and three. So one, I find scales boring. And three, I don't know why I have to do them. Why are scales so important? Well, the first thing is that it will help to build up the muscles in your fingers and your dexterity. So that will also help something that I would call like the balance of touch a little bit later on. But just at the beginning level, you want to think about really building up those muscles. Um, the second thing is that it can really teach you your key signatures. This is a really big one for wanting to play pieces in the first place. So if you are playing a piece in, for example, G major, they will expect you to remember to play an F sharp all the way through that piece even though they've just stuck that sharp right at the beginning of the song and said go on get on remember it having a scale that you can associate with that key signature really helps you to remember that key signature when you're playing a piece the fingering that you learn in scales will really help you with the finger choices in your pieces one really good example of this would be sonata in c by mozart there are a lot of scales in that piece and this is just one of those pieces there are so many that will have scales written in them with no fingers written in whatsoever so being able to pick the right fingers because your hands will just remember them through muscle memory um that's a really good skill to have and not only just scales in pieces to be honest this could be any kind of fingers that you have written in or the absence of fingers that are written, in, written into a piece. A lot of pieces, particularly those that are a slightly harder level, will have no fingers written at all and a lot of the choices that you make will come down to the techniques that you used back when you were doing scales and arpeggios. <laughs> can really help to reinforce some of the information that you learn in your music theory and put a kind of practical spin on what you're learning. In music theory you learn um, a lot of different key signatures. Uh, my students I give them something I call the key signatures table and we just add to that as they progress on and being able to play those scales really helps to reinforce the information that they're being taught on the page. And lastly we can start to detect tonality so that major and minor distinction um, when we start scales you, this is the first time you really start to hear the differences and then you can apply those to your pieces. Um, this is particularly good for something like sight reading where if you know that you're playing a piece in say A minor you kind of know the rough sound to expect from that piece before you even start it. Initially we need to tackle the issue of just sitting down to practice. This honestly was the thing that I struggled with the most as a learner. I was fine once I was sitting down and I was practicing. I mean it was just the sitting down that really was the reason my mum and I used to butt heads um, and I hear the same thing from other people that are learning that are self-motivated or from parents of children that I teach too. So the first thing you need to do is establish a routine. Set a reminder on your phone if you use a phone on a daily basis like most of us do. My phone tells me everything. Honestly I use it for 
everything. <laughs> and I still have a paper diary, but I still use my phone. Um, it's just one of those things that most of us have with us all the time. So either have a reminder that flashes up on your phone that tells you that practice is either due to start or that start it now, or have an alarm that goes off. Um, remember that every day isn't the same. So I would say to sit down and really schedule your practice to what you're doing on that day. So I might, for example, decide on a Monday that I'm going to play the piano from 6 to 6.30, but on a Tuesday it's not feasible because I'm working, so I would probably schedule it for 8 to 8.30. So make it very personal to you, but set those reminders up. And for parents of children that are learning, um, even if they are the teenagers and have their own reminders on their phone, I would suggest syncing up with them and having them on yours as well. So once you've committed to that certain time for practice and you're in this routine of sitting down, the first thing you want to do is your scales. Get your scales done first because A, it gets them out of the way, but also it gets your hands warmed up and ready for your pieces. The excuse I always used to use was that I had so many pieces that I had to do that I wouldn't have had time to do them if I did my scales first. In all honesty, I probably spent more time getting out of mistakes that I probably wouldn't have made if my hands were actually ready to play when I sat down. Use your scales for that, get your hands ready and your brain ready to play. And some of those silly little mistakes may never even happen in your pieces, which just means that you're actually learning your pieces more efficiently. For parents who struggle with getting their children to practice scales, consider something like um, a scales practice-a-thon, or I call them a scale-a-thon, where they have to practice their scales for five to ten minutes every day for a month. And any money that they raise, they either get to keep and spend wisely, or they can give it to a charity. Another game you can play as a parent is to shout out a scale at any time of the day, um, and the student has to then run to the piano and play that scale. For some reason, the little ones love this. I find it fascinating. Quite often they don't play the right thing at the beginning because they're so anxious to get to the piano. That's fine. I would suggest at the beginning just making it that game of running to the piano and playing the scale, even if they make mistakes. Obviously, as they get older and they progress, accuracy becomes more important. But what you're really trying to do is actually just to expose them to, say, just the fingers or just the sitting down part. Um, and once it becomes fun, hopefully the accuracy will then follow as well. So now that we've tackled the sitting down part of things, we're going to have a look at numbers four, five, and six on the excuses list. Four, I don't know if I'm doing them right when I'm at home. Five, I can never remember the key signatures. Six, I can play them hands separately, but not together. Uh, one tip is it's very good to have a chart or some kind of list that goes through all the keys that you've played. So for example, my students have this in the back of their homework book. It will start out when they very when they first come with C major with no key signature. We then move them on to something like G major with an F sharp. And this list runs and we add to it as they progress. Um, one tip that I really like to do is to have them include some kind of rhyme um, to these scales. So for example, G major, F sharp, could be good food. Or one of my favourite ones that actually one of my students told me about, G major, which has F sharp and C sharp, and she uses that as devil's food cake. Yeah. Make it something that you remember. Don't worry about what you've heard me say or what you see somebody else write. Make it something that's personal to you. I always find names are really helpful, um, especially names of people that are in your family. So it's something that's around you all the time, um, but something that will really speak to you and it will something that will stick as well. Consider splitting your scales up into octaves. Um, this really helps numbers four and six on that list of, I don't know if I am doing them right when I'm at home and I can do them separately but not together. Splitting your scales up into octaves is a magical way of really knowing if you're doing the fingers correctly. I have a little video um, which I will insert as well, but you can always go and check out my scales videos that talk you through some of the different scales that we start with. <laughs> By 
splitting up your scales, what you're really doing is ensuring that you understand why you're using certain fingers. And that is the key really to getting through them. If you make a mistake, you know that you can pick it up from wherever you left off and carry on correctly to the end, or you know you might be able to save yourself on the way down. So understanding the finger choices that you're making in your scales is really good. And by splitting up your scales into little bits, it just allows you to see things a little bit more clearly. Now this last point is a bit of a shameless plug, but I would watch the videos I have on scales on my channel. <laughs> These actually are how I would have wanted to have been taught scales in the first place, rather than just being given a list and being told to get on with it. Um, I try really hard to split them up to give you ways to remember them. Like um, one example is that in D minor, we call it the bridge scale. So if you have a look at that video, you'll be able to, I'll, I'll link that below as well, but you'll be able to see um, the little things that pop up that help you to remember where the bridge is. And I have students that have been with me for 10 years plus and still remember learning the bridge scale from when they first came. So obviously these kinds of techniques do work, but if you wanna have a look at those videos, you'll be more than welcome. Lastly, we're going to tackle excuse number two. It's the last one on our list. I don't have time to practice my scales because I have pieces to do. And I know that we've kind of talked a little bit about this already. The first thing you could do is to create a practice chart and include the scales on that chart so that it is actually a written part of your routine. I'd suggest this was more of my adults that would follow this. Um, by having something written down, it really does formalize it. And I find that a lot of my adults um, and actually the teenagers upwards would probably appreciate that written formalization a little bit more. And another good way to do it is to split your practice into two parts. And I do this for um, actually, to be honest, it is any age because life does get so busy and it gets busy early on, doesn't it? Now children have so many clubs. Um, so what you could do is to split this into a scales practice and a pieces practice. So you could do 10 minutes on scales in the morning before school or before work. And then when you get back, you've then got time to work on your pieces for, say, 20 minutes, half an hour. Although I wouldn't necessarily choose this if I could do one full sitting, because having that warm up before you play your pieces really is invaluable. This is still one way to ensure that you're getting everything done, but you're not trying to figure out a way of spending half an hour to 40 minutes at one time in your day when life really can get quite hectic. Some final bits to help you once you're in your routine. Um, firstly, the fingers that you choose. Fingers in scales really are vital. There's no getting away from it. You have to make sure that the fingers that you do in your scales are correct. Um, and again, you can use any of the techniques that we've already talked about. Scales books, some people do use them, um, but just make sure that it's something that you're aware of whilst you're practicing. If you're doing an exam, um, try to practice your scales out of sequence. So by this, this is actually um, something that I, I struggled with as well. Um, if I had an exam coming up, I would open my pieces book to the scales list and play the scales in order. And although that really helped me, um, to make sure that I'd kind of ticked everything off. I'm that kind of person. I do like a good list. Um, when I came to having a test and my teacher would say, play me this scale, I really struggled because I didn't have all of the others to go before it to help me remember them. So um, it's something that you have to work on if you're in that kind of habit. It's an easy to form habit, believe me. I see it an awful lot. And sometimes it's not something you're trying to do. You're just you just have an order whether you realize it or not. So by having, um, you can have scales apps that will help you or asking a family member to give you a scales test, but actually playing those out of order will really help you to find the scales that you're happy with and those that aren't. And that will then just streamline your practice so that you only practice the ones that really need it. Along with scales apps, um, you can create your own flashcards. I do have some of my students do this, um, particularly the ones that aren't very into using technology and even some of the little ones who might struggle with using technology. Um, all you really need is uh, a few bigger cards, so three, one for your right hand, one for your left, and one for hands together, if that is something that you need at the time. Um, and then some cards that list out your scales. And all you do is pick out one of the bigger cards, which will tell you which hand or hands together, and then you pick um, a scale at random. And again, this is a really good way of just making sure your scales are being played out of sequence. 
for those who are playing with scales outside of an exam, um, try if you can to learn your scales in such a way that it allows you to play on a loop. Now by this I mean that if you're in an exam you have a certain list of scales that you have to learn. Um, but if you're not doing that, what you can afford to do, and if this is something that your teacher thinks would, would benefit you, you could learn C major and then learn C minor. And what that would do, that would allow you to play C major straight into C minor, and it really helps the muscle memory. This honestly saved me at grade five level, playing these on a loop. Um, I will insert an example, um, but also another way to then level up for the more advanced pianist is to play your major, your harmonic minor, your melodic minor, and then also add the arpeggios onto the end. I will insert a clip so you can see what that looks like, but that's a really good way of doing this so that you get the muscle. <laughs> play is actually to play a short piece in that key. Um, I tend to do this with my non-exam students um, and also when we're in between grades with the ones that are doing exams. If a student has done a grade and they're struggling with say I don't know E flat major what we will do is between grades um, we always play different pieces anyway and I would try and give them a piece in E flat major just to reinforce that particular key and work on the skill that perhaps they need that little bit more on. One of the fun ones you can do, younger students can create um, a scales poster. I've honestly loved seeing these over the years. The children never cease to amaze me with how good they are with art. <laughs> so much better than I would be. I could draw Sonic the Hedgehog and that's about it. Um, but well, we talked earlier on about having um, a little rhyme or something that you can use to help you like good food, devil's food cake actually putting that into a poster for the children really works um, and it's really nice for them to look back and see some of their old drawings as well as they get harder scales and new posters. And the final one is to add dynamics to your scales. This was a tip that was given to me um, by a concert pianist who happened to be at um, a performance I was doing when I was about nine, ten, and he told me to crescendo on the way up so get louder on the way up and to diminuendo on the way down so to get quieter on the way down and to play my scales like my pieces and I can't tell you the difference that made to me at grade 8 I actually enjoyed playing them that much more and had a comment from the examiner that he liked listening to them which was something I just never even considered I'd never considered um my examiner's point of view but it is something that I really try to push home to my students that imagine if you're an examiner and you're sitting there and you're hearing scales all day to have someone play them with a sense of enjoyment or character what that must do I mean it must be so nice just to hear something a little bit different um, and just from a personal point of view it's a lot nicer having to think about something else in your scales apart from just the key signature and the fingers. One other addition to that is that quite often my students will find that when they add dynamics into their scales some will be absolutely fine but others all of a sudden slight mistakes will creep in and that to me just suggests that perhaps they don't know that scale as well as they thought they did so that could have been a tripping point in the exam so then they would then use that information and work on that scale in practice so by adding dynamics not only you're getting character you're really looking at which scales you do and don't know i hope that you found this video helpful um it's something that i really wish I'd had when I was learning and I think my mum would have gotten a lot out of as well to be honest it was our biggest issue um, was a sitting down to practice and, and b with scales she never ever had to tell me to tell my pieces but it was always the scales um, if you found this video helpful I would love it if you could give it a thumbs up and again if you haven't subscribed already please consider hitting that subscribe button and you'll be notified of any new videos that I have coming up Take care, look after yourself. See you soon.